Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all the speakers, shares, and the wonderful audiences in different parts of the world. Welcome to SNS webinars. The speaker for the first session of today is our honorable guest from Japan, Professor Makoto Sakamoto. Professor Sakamoto is an associate professor at the Division of Neurosurgery in the Department of Brain and Neurosciences, Faculty of Medicine, Totori University, Japan. He is an important member of the Japan Neurosurgical Society as well as the Japan Society for Neuroendovascular Therapy. We are extremely honored to have him today at webinars and today he will be talking about endovascular therapy for difficult aneurysms and ischemic stroke. The speaker for the second session of today is our honored guest also from Japan, Professor Shinichi Yoshimura. Professor Yoshimura is the Professor and Chairman, Department of Neurosurgery at the Hyogo College of Medicine, Hyogo, Japan. Professor Yoshimura was a past president of the Japan Society of Neuroendovascular Therapy and he is a board member of the Japanese Society of Neuroendovascular Therapy, the Japanese Neurosurgical Congress and the Counselor for the Japanese Stroke Association. He was a past editor of the Journal of Neuroendovascular Therapy and was the past president of the Mount Fuji Congress as well as the Japan Neurosurgical Congress in the past. We are extremely honored to have him today at webinars and today he will be talking about endovascular therapy for acute stroke with large ischemic region which is the Rescue Japan Limit Trial. The chair for today's webinar is our honored guest from India, Professor Srinivasan Paramasivan. He is a consultant neurosurgeon and endovascular neurosurgeon at the Apollo Hospital, Chennai, India. He was previously affiliated with institutions like Mount Sinai and Beth Israel Hospitals and is a noted author with several publications in various period journals. We are extremely honored to have him today at our webinars to chair the session of uh, both Professor Yoshimura as well as Professor Sakamoto. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome both the speakers, Chair and the wonderful audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. A very warm welcome to our colleagues in China and we are extremely grateful to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. With that introduction, I would like to hand over this online podium to Professor Sakamoto. Thank you for your kind introduction. Today, I will present mechanical thrombectomy for AIS of complicated regions and endovascular treatment for cerebral aneurysms difficult to treat. COI disclosure is as follows. I'd like to introduce myself briefly. My name is Makoto Sakamoto, Associated Professor of the Division of Neurosurgery, Toto University. I trained in neuroendovascular therapy at Tranomon Hospital by Professor Nemoto. I'd like to talk about two main topics. First, I'm going to talk about refractory regions for mechanical thrombectomy. Second, I will talk about the embolization of an aneurysm that is difficult to treat. In refractory regions for mechanical thrombectomy, I want to discuss the following four topics. First, regions difficult to access. Second, cases of vaginal artery occlusion. Third, cases of medium vessel occlusion. Finally, tandem region. The first topic is the anatomical factors involved in the difficulty of inserting a guiding catheter. Difficult to access regions in anterior circulation may include type 3 aortic arch regions and severe toe chastity immediately after the left common carotid artery origin. Here I will present the balloon inflation anchoring technique, BIAT, in the type 3 arch. First, hook a Simmons type inner catheter into the brachiocephalic artery and advance the guide wire distally. Then, balloon guiding is inflated to anchor at the origin of the brachiocephalic artery. Using a balloon anchored to the brachiocephalic artery as a support, the inner catheter is advanced distally. Then, inflate and deflate the balloon to get it into the flow and gradually advance it to the distal CCA and then to the ICA. Here I will present a representative case. A 78-year-old male, independent in ADL, his sister found him collapsed in the bathroom. 
Neurological Status on Admission, Light Hemiplegia, Total Aphasia, NIHSS 20 points, he had no AF. 3D CTA showed occlusion of the left internal carotid artery, and cerebral perfusion imaging showed no significant mismatch between the ischemic core and penumbra. So initially, revascularization was not considered, and then a head MRI was performed. Diffusion MRI showed very limited ischemic cores. ASL imaging showed an extensive low perfusion area in the left cerebral hemisphere, resulting in a diffusion perfusion mismatch. As a result, an emergent thrombectomy was performed. The BIAT technique was used because the guiding catheter could not be guided into the left common carotid artery using the usual method. This is balloon guiding catheter. The left internal carotid angiogram revealed occlusion of the C3 portion of the intracranial ICA. Phenom 27 was advanced to penetrate the thrombus. Solitia 6x40 was deployed at the thrombus site. Immediate flow restoration was not obtained. REACT-71 was advanced as close as possible to the thrombus. Pull out solidity and REACT as one unit. The ICA and ACA were recanalized, but M1 could not. Pass the region with Phenom-27 again. Solitia deployed more distally than the first procedure. REACT was advanced distally enough to the proximal end of the thrombus. Then pull out solidity and react as one unit. TK3 recanalization was achieved. Diffusion weighted MRI after thrombectomy showed a new small ischemic region in the basal ganglia and the deep white matter, but the patient's symptoms improved markedly. This slide shows a flow chart of the choice of procedure in case of difficulty approaching the region. Determine whether a transfemoral or brachial approach is better based on the toxicity of the proximal vessel towards the intracranial vessel reaching the region. If the BIAT technique fails, we use the cell E as a guiding catheter for thrombectomy. Direct carotid puncture is the last resort, but I don't want to do it because of the hemostasis issue. I will present the next case. 94-year-old woman sees independent in ADLs. When daycare staff visited her, she could not speak and had right-sided hemiparesis and aphasia. NIHSS 7. This figure shows the cell E cassita. The tip of the cassita is shaped like JB2 and has a lumen of 8 French, so that an aspiration cassita can pass through the inside of this cassita. The cassita is hooked to the aortic arch, and an aspiration cassita can be guided intracranially for thrombectomy. 3DCTA showed occlusion of distal M1 of left MCA. Brain perfusion imaging shows the penumbra area. At first, we tried the BIAT technique, but it didn't work well. Insertion by hooking the chip of cell E at the origin of the left common carotid artery. This is cell E. Angiogram revealed occlusion of the left M1 segment. When CAT6 was induced distally via cell E as a guiding catheter, that was stable and did not deviate. Phenom 21 micro catheter was advanced distal to the thrombus. Then the CAT6 was navigated distally.
Phenom 21 was passed through the thrombus. Then Solitia X 4x40 was advanced and deployed at the thrombus site. Immediate flow restoration was obtained. CAT-6 was advanced to the proximal side of the thrombus as far as possible. Thrombectomy was performed with Solitia X drawn into the aspiration catheter. TIC-2C recanalization was obtained. Now we discuss vaginal artery occlusion. Recent RCTs have shown the superiority of endovascular therapy over medical therapy in vaginal artery occlusion. I will show you a representative case. 70-year-old male, the patient de developed a sudden loss of consciousness and was brought to our hospital. 3D CTA showed occlusion of the vaginal apex and cerebral perfusion imaging showed a wide penumbra area, mainly in the cerebellum. The left subclavian angiogram showed no access problem. A penumbra led 68 aspiration catheter was advanced along with a synchro select and phenom 21 micro catheter. The vertebral angiogram revealed occlusion of the upper vaginal artery. Let 68 was advanced to penetrate the proximal side of the clot slightly. After confirming that the aspiration to suction tube had stopped, the let 68 aspiration catheter was gently retrieved. The angiogram showed complete recanalization of vaginal artery. Postoperative MRI showed a complete recanalization of the vaginal artery and small cerebral infarction in the cerebral hemisphere, but the patient was discharged with no neurological deficit. We next discuss medium vessel occlusion. There is no clear evidence about mechanical thrombectomy for M2 regions. Rescue Japan Registry 2 studies showed 57.1% of patients with MRS 0 to 2 at 3 months with endovascular treatment and 32.6% with medical treatment indicating the superiority of endovascular therapy. Another study shows more symptomatic ICH with thrombectomy in M2 occlusion compared to M1 occlusion. So we can expect good results even with M2 regions if we select appropriate cases and treat them without complications. I will show you a representative case. An 81 year-old man, medical doctor, medical history. He had cerebral infarction three years ago and has been on apixaban 10 mg per day since then. His wife found him unable to speak after he had come home from work. He had consciousness disturbance with disorientation, spatial neglect, aphasia, and paraplegia of the lower limbs. NIHS S4 points. 4D and 3D CTA revealed occlusion of the left M2 inferior trunk. Although the NIHS score was low, the patient underwent an emergent thrombectomy because of his occupation, symptoms, and the other factors. Preoperative cerebral perfusion imaging showed penumbral lesions in the left temporal lobe.
left CAG revealed occlusion of M2 inferior trunk. The first procedure used a Solitia 3 by 20 mm and Sophia 5 French. However, the Solitia was damaged. A partial recanalization of the M2 was obtained. For the second procedure, we used a Treble NXT 3 mm by 32 mm. Flow restoration was obtained after the deployment of Treble NXT. Post operative DSA showed Tiki 2C recanalization. Post operative CT showed no new ischemic region. His condition fully recovered, and he was discharged on his own. Combined thrombectomy for M2 regions, contacting the aspiration catheter as proximal to the thrombus as possible is important to minimize vessel traction due to stent pullback. Once the aspiration catheter contacts the clot, wait to 1 to 2 minutes and the suction continued. Then, slowly retrieve the stent and aspiration catheter as a unit. Next, I will discuss tandem region. Which approach is better, anti-grade or retrograde? The anti-grade approach treats the carotid region first and retrieves the intracranial thrombus, while the retrograde approach is opposite. First, evaluate the pathophysiology of carotid artery regions, then we will consider if there is enough diameter to allow the aspiration catheter to pass through the stenosis. If the answer is yes, then thrombectomy for intracranial regions using a stent and aspiration catheter, and then we will perform PTA and CAS for carotid artery stenosis. If there is not enough diameter to allow the aspiration catheter to pass through the stenosis, we must perform PTA and CAS first for carotid artery stenosis, and then thrombectomy for intracranial regions using a stent and aspiration catheter. Representative case. A 56-year-old man, his colleague found him collapsed at work and called an ambulance. Diffusion-weighted imaging showed a moderate ischemic region in the right middle cerebral artery territory, and MRA showed poor visualization of the right internal carotid artery. An aspiration catheter could not pass through the severe stenosis. REACT-71 was passed through the stenosis after PTA using RX Genity 3 by 30 mm. Solitia 4 by 40 mm was deployed at the thrombus site, and an aspiration catheter connected to a pump was advanced to the proximal side of the thrombus. Angiogram just after the thrombectomy and the CAS revealed ticket to be recanalization, and the patient was discharged independently without any neurological deficit. The next topic is the embolization of an aneurysm that is difficult to treat. Coiling for bifurcation aneurysm often requires adjunctive techniques because of its wide neck morphology. Thanks to its low profile construction, Neuroform Atlas and Elvis Jr. stent can be deployed via micro catheter for coil delivery. The purpose of this study is to report the safety and efficacy of wide configured low profile stent assisted coiling for a wide neck aneurysm. Pros and cons of Y stent assisted coiling. In crossing Y stent, focal kinking of the second stent may cause thromboembolic complications. 
Hybrid by stent using open cell stent as a first stent may reduce thromboembolism because open cell stents are better wall opposition to tortuous anatomies. Less metal usage of the atlas stent might be beneficial concerning the reduced stroke rate compared to the predecessor stent. The procedure of low profile by stent. All patients received 75 clopidogrel and 100 mg aspirin daily for at least 10 days before the procedure. Antiplatelet activity was evaluated using Verify Now. Patients of poor responders of clopidogrel were switched to plusgrel. To navigate the microguide wire into the most angled branch from the aneurysm, a very small J-shape must be formed at the tip of the microcatheter. A soft chip microguide wire can be advanced more distal to the branch without stretching the J-shaped microcatheter. Advance the microcatheter following a preceding microguide wire. Insertion of a microcatheter into the aneurysm for coiling. Neuroform atlas is deployed in the more acutely angled branch. Be careful if the proximal side of the atlas deployed is not long enough, attempts at catheterization of the other branch may cause the migration or dislocation of the, the neuroform atlas. Headway duo is advanced through the stent struts of the neuroform atlas previously deployed. Then Elvis Jr. is deployed as a second stent. Slightly push the delivery wire of the Elvis stent to expand its lumen at the crossing point of two stents. Then we access the aneurysm with a headway duo through the stent struts of both stents to perform double microcatheter coiling. The advantages of atlas as a first stent is kinking of the second stent is minimum because of its open cell structure, accuracy of deployment because of loss for shortening, conformability around acute angles, struts act as anchors and stabilize the stent. The advantages of Elvis Jr. as a second stent is higher scaffolding and diverting effect because of its braided design. Expandability of stent struts by pushing delivery wire at the crossing point of two stents. Atlas and Elvis Jr. A 70-year-old woman was diagnosed with an unruptured cerebral aneurysm after close examination for headaches. The maximum diameter of the cerebral aneurysm was approximately 6 mm, and the neck of the aneurysm was extremely wide, suggesting that some adjunctive technique was needed. Dual injection from the bilateral ICA revealed triple ACA and wide neck an ACOM aneurysm. At first, advance the microcatheter with J-shaped chip from the left A1 to the left A2. Microguide wire was 10 low. Next, Phenom 70 microcatheter was advanced into the aneurysm 
Neuroform Atlas was deployed from the left A2 to the left A1. This is Neuroform Atlas. Some loops of Hydrosoft 3D coil were inserted into the aneurysm. Then headway duo was advanced through the stent strut of the Neuroform Atlas from the left A1 to the third A2 via ACOM. Elvis Jr. was deployed between the third A2 to left A1 via the aneurysm neck. This is Elvis Jr. stent. Once the Y stent was in place, coil embolization was continued. Microcasita was repositioned when the microcasita was coming off from the aneurysm. Post-operative angiogram showed near complete occlusion of the aneurysm. This slide shows intraoperative high-resolution CONBIM CT with diluted contrast media after the deployment of stents. The left figure shows neuroform atlas is deployed from the left A2 to the left A1. The right figure shows hybrid Y stent using Neuroform Atlas and Elvis Jr. stent. Post-operative angiogram revealed near-complete occlusion of the aneurysm. Finally, I will present coiling and overlapping flow diverters with short and low-dose anticoagulation for aneurysms difficult to cure with a flow diverter. Reported factors associated with incomplete occlusion in the treatment with flow diverter are as follows. First, aneurysms larger than 15 mm is independently associated with a higher rate of incomplete occlusion. And the involvement of a side branch was also related to incomplete occlusion. This study aims to evaluate the outcomes of these intractable lesions treated with coiling and overlapping flow diverter with short and low dose anticoagulation to prevent thromboembolic complications. This study includes eight cases. The mean age was 68.6 years. Six women were included in this study. The aneurysm location was 4 ICPC, 3 vagilar trunk, and 1 vertebral. Recurrent aneurysms after coil embolization was 6 cases. The mean maximum diameter was 19.8 mm. Flow diverters used to overlap were 4 sets of pipeline and 4 sets of fret. There were 5 symptomatic cases, and all had partial thrombosis in that aneurysm. Dual antiplatelet therapy with clopidogrel or prasugrel and aspirin was started one to three weeks before the procedure. Complete occlusion was observed in all patients that could be followed up for more than six months. Ischemic complication was observed in two cases. In the case of ICPC aneurysm, Transient hemiparesis occurred one week after DAPT was changed to SAPT, but there were no new ischemic symptoms after switching to DAPT using Shirostazole. In the case of vaginal trunk aneurysm, we could not have administered an oral anticoagulant because of postoperative CT revealed a small cerebral hemorrhagic infarction. The patient had gait disturbance due to brainstem perforator infarction seven days after the procedure. The key factors of this treatment strategy are as follows. 
first factor is overlapping flow diverter. Does overlapping flow diverter enhance flow diversion effect? The CFD simulation result shows that the overlapping flow diverter revealed a significant decrease in the flow velocity within the aneurysm and lowers the wall shear stress in the aneurysm. This result supports that overlapping FD will strongly enhance the diversion effect. The second key factor is FD with adjunctive coiling. This paper shows that pipeline and adjunctive coiling demonstrated a significantly higher angiographic occlusion rate than pipeline alone. The last key factor of this treatment is post-operative low-dose short-term oral anticoagulation therapy. In this paper, gelled anterior colloidal artery Arising from aneurysmal dome had occluded seven days after FD and adjunctive coiling. The anterior colloidal artery did not have contact with the flow diverter stent. Factors associated with branch occlusion are as follows. Some space between stent strut and origin of branch. Poor collateral supply. Rapid progression of thrombus formation. In case of the slow progression of thrombus formation, a side branch root remains in the aneurysm and antegrade flow is preserved due to flow demand. To achieve slow progression of thrombus formation, we administered half dose oral anticoagulant to these patients for one to two months. Why do we choose short and half dose anticoagulants? Because complete obliteration of the cerebral aneurysm is difficult to achieve in patients taking anticoagulants. Additional oral anticoagulants before FD increase hemorrhagic complications so, we administer oral administration of edokisaban 30 mg, it's a half dose, for one to two months. Illustrative cases. This 70-year-old man came to our department due to diplopia and dysalusuria. CTA revealed a partially thrombosed of the giant aneurysm at the vaginal artery compressing the brain stem. At first, coiling of the aneurysm using ruby coils was performed. Ruby coils are very thick and long. Then two frets were deployed in an overlapping fashion. And then, Angioplasty with undue balloon was performed at the stenotic regions. DSA six months after procedure showed complete occlusion of the aneurysm. Second case, this 73-year-old woman pointed out an ICPC aneurysm due to close examination of her headache. Angiogram reveal fetal type PCOM is arising from the aneurysmal sac. Stent assisted coiling was performed after deployment of neuroform atlas from the PCOM to the ICA. Initial stent assisted coiling was successful. But DSA six months after the first embolization showed a major aneurysm recurrence. The additional coil was filled within the aneurysm, and then two pipelines were deployed in an overlapping fashion. 
first pipeline and the second pipeline. PTA was performed after the deployment of pipelines. Post-operative angiogram showed preserving of the PCOM and prostasis of the aneurysm. Follow-up DSA has not been obtained yet. In conclusion, the combination of coiling. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Professor Sakamoto, it's a wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed your uh, case series. Uh, Thank you very is, much. Uh, it was quite interesting, the variety of cases that you have done. I do understand that you have some limitations with the num newer devices that you use in Japan. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So uh, I have a few uh, cla uh, uh, I mean, clarifications. If you can explain, it will make... Uh, your presentation even more interesting. Uh, in in one of those basilar aneurysms, basilar aneurysm. you yes. put a ruby coils and then after that yes. you've done double stenting and yes. you did an angioplasty. So can you explain okay. your idea behind that angioplasty? Yes. In that case, uh, thrombosis uh, embolism is... Uh, occurred in a narrow segment. So I do, I did uh, PTA uh, using uh, balloon cachita. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, but is, is it, uh, yes. is so that a routine I, practice? Uh, I always uh, PTA uh, in overlapping flow diverter case. So it's important to uh, fit uh, the wall to the flow diverter. It's the most important factor to uh, uh, treat in, in those cases. Wall up position is the most important for that kind of cases, I think. Very interesting, very interesting, good. And uh, another point you brought out beautifully is in one of the flow diverter cases, if the branch vessel is not opposing to the yes. flow diverter, especially the anterior choroidal, there could be a yes. progressive thrombus and occlusion of the anterior choroidal. Yes. And, but in cases where we have ophthalmic origin, in most cases, we don't try to oppose it or it may not be opposable because it's within the bony groove or close to the bony groove, we hardly see thrombosis. How do you explain that? And in the uh, ophthalmic case, right? Yeah, correct. Uh, uh, we, we will uh, overlap uh, the flow diverter in case with uh, branch arising from aneurysmal sac, uh, that is uh, same as ophthalmic artery. In that case, uh, branching from uh, sac uh, is not good for uh, cure uh, to aneurysm. So we will uh, use coiling and flow diverter uh, overlapping in that kind of case. Okay, right? Fantastic, fantastic. Okay, good. And uh, my, my, I mean, my last question is, I mean, do you have the newer devices like web and contour available in your country? Yes, that, that kind of device is uh, available in Japan, but I have no experience with that uh, kind of devices. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Perhaps Dr. Yoshimura will uh, use uh, that kind of devices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, what, what do you mean? Uh, the contour devices. Do you use it? Contour. Web, uh, yes, web. web device. Yes, I have some yes. experience with that. Yes, that is sometimes well fits the aneurysm, 
but the uh, indication is limited due to uh, the um, size is uh, still large. Um, so we need uh, uh, the most uh, newest devices, uh, 17 uh, sizes device. Got you. There is one question in the chat box. Yes. Dr. Harshad Parekh has asked, what is the maximum time window period of onset of stroke symptoms and mechanical thrombectomy for good outcome? That depends on the cases. So it's important to uh, review the uh, perfusion image. Uh, we uh, decided the, uh, to do thrombectomy uh, uh, on perfusion image, uh, it's important to evaluate uh, before treating uh, on perfusion image. Okay. Perfect. It depends on the uh, perfusion image. Yes. So you mean to say, uh, Professor Sakamoto, you mean to say that we have moved from fixed timeline window to tissue yes. window. So the yes, yes. oh yes, that's right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. The tissue window is the more realistic way of assessing patients who will benefit yes. from back then. Yes. Yes. I, I would like to ask one more uh question. Um you have showed a uh, thrombectomy using solitaire device yes what is your experience with other devices compared to solitaire and do you think is there any newer device or advancement beyond solitaire that helps you achieve better thrombectomy okay uh, i always use uh, solitaire stand because it's uh, easy to deploy the stent for all uh, doctors. Uh, that that uh, in that uh, acute cases, uh, I only I uh, will perform thrombectomy. <coughs> not uh, not only I, but uh, as a member. Uh, sh uh, perform thrombectomy. So it's important to use easily to deploy and retrieve the stent. So we first use a uh, soldier stent. Okay. Good, good. Yeah, I think uh, you, you derived the point that rather than the newer devices, it is better to use mm -hmm. the device that you are comfortable, you're confident with. I think that is a message you want to deliver. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Fantastic. I think we may move on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Liu, thank you. Would you, is there any comments from your side, Liu? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Professor. Uh, two questions, Professor. Uh, in in, in uh, acute ischemia due to a major vessel uh, thrombo um, uh, thrombosis, uh, in the case of fell uh, thrombectomy, uh, what yeah. are the other option available and how long do we wait for for the se second treatment uh, my second question professor uh, in in your cross uh, a stand that you use uh, for both cases uh, acom and also bacillus top aneurysm uh, in the cases of recurrences what are the options available thank you professor thank you for your question uh, first question. First question is uh, uh, M2 region, uh, MIBO region uh, for treatment. Uh, if uh, we perform stent retriever is not failure, uh, we will do uh, piercing the guide wire. And now we can't use, uh, but uh, former, formerly, formerly. We use uh, 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 local uh, fibrinolysis uh, in that case. The second question, uh, to, uh, could you repeat the second question? Uh, 
uh, in recurrences when you use a cross uh, stand that you show in both ECOM and uh, bacillus top and reserve in recurrences, in recurrences. Can we uh, deploy another stand? Is there such option? Yes. Uh, recurrent case, in recurrent case, uh, second stand is a uh, good option for uh, that in that case, I think. For, for which side? You use one side, you use braided stand? Uh, you yes. show one side, you use braided stand, and one is yes, the Elvis yes. stand. So yes, you, can put, and, uh, yeah. you can put uh, another stand on both or one side? Uh, both braided stands, right? No, you show that one you use the LV stand, another one you use the braided stand, right? Yes. The braided stand can open up the LV stand. You show in your yes. basket top. So when you deploy another stand for recurrences, would you deploy stand on both sides or one side? Uh, yes, uh, in one side, yes, because uh, if you use uh, braided stand, both of stands, uh, kinking of the stand will be occur in crossing point. So thromboembolism will uh, uh, experience in that, in that case, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sakamoto and uh, Professor Paramasivam. We had a wonderful session and we learned a lot. And we are extremely grateful to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this on the WeChat channel. And as of now, we have around 340 people who have joined us on YouTube, WeChat and Zoom. Now it's time we can move on to the second session. And the second session is also about endovascular therapy where Professor Yoshimura is going to talk about a rescue Japan limit trial which is endovascular thrombectomy for uh, large ischemic region strokes. So Professor Parmashivam would be chairing this session as well. Over to Professor Parmashivam. Yes, we will go ahead with the second session. Please uh, share the screen and uh, st start the presentation please. Okay. Thank you for your introduction. I'm Dr. Yoshimura. I uh, I was suddenly asked to make a talk from Raj, and uh, yes, I'm uh, actually happy with that. So today I'm going to talk about endovascular therapy for acute ischemic stroke with a large ischemic region core uh, named the uh, Rescue Japan Limit. This is my disclosures. I had a training in National Cerebral Cardiovascular Center from 1994 to 1997 in Osaka. I was mainly uh, 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 in neurosurgery for three years and about two months in vascular neurology. I learned uh, medical treatment with uh, great uh, members. Open surgery was dominant in neurosurgery, but I was intentionally involved in EVT. It was uh, only uh, a vertebral artery origin, uh, angioplasty, or some intra-arterial injection of the medicine for basal spasm at the time. One day, after finishing training in uh, Osaka, I returned to my hometown. And one day in 1997, my mother visited my apartment. She was carrying my daughter and holding the baby with only her left hand. So I felt strange. So I said, what's wrong with you? And noticed that her right arm was flushed and she had no word. She was suffering from stroke, I thought. I immediately called an ambulance. My university hospital just received two emergency cases, so I transferred her to another stroke center. I prayed and saw head CT 
it showed no hemorrhage. She has a chance, I thought. At that time, intravenous TPA was not available for uh, ischemic stroke. Only intraterial urokinase was the choice. I was wondering if I should call my mentor, but I thought, what should I do if something, some complication happened or symptoms remained? So I decided to treat her by myself. Angel, he was started and puncture and angel were done immediately without any trouble and found that peripheral MCAs were occluded. I was trying to decide the dose of TPA, but I was almost frozen when I thought this is my mother. My senior doctor said, what are you doing, Yoshimura? That call made me awake. But the MCAs were not opened by IATPA, unfortunately. Increased dose of TPA may lead to hemorrhage. But I couldn't stop the treatment because she still had severe hemiparesis and aphasia. I decided to inject maximum dose of TPA and navigated a wire to disrupt the clots. Finally, unfortunately, uh, 70 to 80% of the vessels were opened. Hemparesis was improved immediately after EBT. I was so happy with that. But she didn't talk at all. I thought that she couldn't return to her work. However, she gradually started to talk and return to her job in next month. She was saved by EBT. After that, EBT for AIS was one of my life works. IBTP was approved in 2005 in Japan. Japan Stroke Society strongly recommended this treatment based on high quality of evidence. An RCT regarding IA urokinase for MC occlusion, Melt Japan, was stopped suddenly. Somebody, internal physician, said that EBT will disappear like melt Japan. It will melt, he said. I was so sad to hear that and I wanted to say something to that, but I couldn't because there was no evidence for EBT for AIS at that time. And also, one of my seniors kindly told me you'd better stop EBT for AIS because it will be replaced by IBTPA in the near future, he said kindly. But I was wondering whether IBTPA was so strong enough because we experienced frequently growth was so tough even by IATPA and angioplasty. Is it really melt by IVTPA? That was my frank question. Uh, this is a typical case of our experience just after approval of IVTPA, right IC occlusion with minimum um, signals in the affected hemisphere. EBT, EB, TPA was immediately administered, but next day, big infarction was formed. So we experienced similar cases and no improvement was obtained, especially in patients with ICA occlusion or M1 occlusion. So we started mechanical 
disruption of the thrombus by balloon. This is the first case, right M1 occlusion, after one hour after bolus injection of TPA intravenously. So we navigated the balloon, and only by navigation of the balloon, M1 was uh, recanalized, and the next day, CTA showed a complete reperfusion. Patient symptoms were dramatically improved. So we reported the first case in a local meeting. More than 10 doctors raised their hands. So I was happy to look at that. They will support us. But actually, their comment was like this. That was spontaneous reperfusion due to IBTPA. This is a serious violation of our society's guideline. You should stop doing this immediately. So we received heavy criticisms. We reported a series of this technique. Uh, look at this. Among eight cases treated by balloon mechanical disruption, four patients showed dramatic improvement. So we report this to our official journal of journal, um, Japan Society. Somebody evaluated positively, but some not. Dr. Kuwayama, uh, president of JSNet at that time, kindly requested me to perform a surveillance regarding IBTP and EBT for AIS. This is a result of the questionnaire. Um, ICA, M1 proximal, and the vaginal artery were not well reperfused by IBTPA. And also, in the patient, uh, in the IBTPA failed patient, endovascular therapy was very effective. This is the reperfusion rate, very effective. So, this was the first Re Rescue Japan study. The study was published in Cerebral Vascular Disease at the time as Rescue Japan retrospective study, but nothing was changed. Still, they said uh, this is an experimental treatment without any evidence. You had better stop doing this. So dark period for EVT continued. New devices for mechanical thrombectomy were approved in 2010 and 2011. These devices were actually immature in terms of re reperfusion ability, but endovascular therapy was officially approved in our country. That was a very big uh, period for us. Also, we heard that in ISC, to 2013 in Honolulu, uh, three RCTs regarding AIS will be reported. So we took cameras to take historical presentations. However, these three RCTs failed to show the efficacy of mechanical thrombectomy. So we call this Honolulu shock. What were the reasons of the failures one, one was a long time to start EBT, and second one is reperfusion rate was extremely low at that time. Unfortunately, stent retriever was newly approved in our country, and we found that that device had a, uh, was a highly effective to reperfuse the best cells. So we saw that and we plan to start an RCT, Rescue Japan RCT, because we thought that we may be able to show the efficacy of mechanical thrombectomy for acute elbow with stent retriever. Clinical evidence was essential to continue MT at the time due to a heavy criticism. And RCTs are all, all, also mandatory to change guidelines. We, we thought we need an own evidence due to racial and TPA dose differences. 
between Japan and the Western countries. So we decided to start an RCT. New studies consisted of Rescue Japan RCT and also registry. This was called as Old Kama Design. I learned this、uh, way in the conference of、uh, cardiology. And it started at the end of 2014. However, new RCT was reported unexpectedly in 2015, just two months after that. Uh, you, you know well, this is a Mr. Green. That was the first RCT showing effectiveness of MT. But we continued the registration because one succeeded and three failed. And also in ISC 2015 in Nashville, additional three RCTs were reported. And All additional, these are all additional three RCTs showed effectiveness of MT. Rescue Japan RCT was not involved in world evidences due to a small number of patients. This is very famous guidelines from the AHA showing, recommending MT with a stent retriever. if The patient meet all the following criteria from one to six. But how many patients can receive MT based on this guideline? In real world, only 15 to 20% of the patient met this guidelines criteria in our analysis using the data of registry due to location. Other than ICA or M1, aspects below six, NIHSS below six, or other contraindications for MT. So, how to treat more patients? Treatment indications is limited according to guidelines. Can we expand the indication of MT? We should know the effect of EBT in these conditions. There are several targets to expand the indication of MT like this. Among them, we focused on number four, large ischemic region, because we experienced the, these cases. Case one was、uh, 50s male. The patient was transferred to a hospital due to sudden consciousness disturbance and left hand paresis. NHSS was 27. Onset to imaging was only 88 minutes, but, but the huge weighted image showed、uh, aspect 4 already.、Uh, right ICA to M1 was completely occluded. This is usually completely. Out of indication for MT, but the patient family strongly requested us to do something with catheter. So we got the informed consent and performed the DSA, and it showed the right ICA total occlusion. And we used、uh, aspiration catheter and the stent retriever, and fortunately got the complete reperfusion like this. I was afraid of the hemorrhage because、uh, post operative CT showed a high density in the MCA territory like this. So we carefully and strictly controlled the patient's blood pressure in the ICU and day three. The patient started to raise his hand and also fully recovered at day 10, like this. So we thought that EBT was effective, even the patient. Infarction was large. Case two, 70s male transferred to our hospital due to sudden right hand paresis and aphasia. NHSS was 26. DWI aspect was four. Very similar com- condition in,、uh, as case one. We actually recommended the patient family to receive EBT this time. Because onset to imaging was only 42 minutes and performed the MT completely reperfused like this. So we, are ha- we were happy with that. However, next day, CT scan showed a severe 
hemorrhagic transformation like this. So what was the difference between these cases? Are we doing good things or bad things? So to know that, we performed a sub-analysis of uh, Rescue Japan registry and Dr. Kakita, our uh, colleague, uh, showed that uh, clinical result was much better in EBT group. As just said, odds ratio was 2.8. So we decided to try an RCT one more time. In the previous RCT, it took a long time to take all opinions from the participants. So this time, we made a protocol in the limited members who are familiar with clinical trials and started with the members who agreed the protocol. Key points in making a protocol was a patient number, primary outcome, aspects on CT or MRI or pre-stroke MRS. Among them, we had a big discussion about the primary outcomes. MRS should be there to two or there to three. And uh, this is um, the name of the study, Rescue Japan Limit and the March Center, non-industry supported, randomized, open label, parallel group clinical trial. It started 2018 November and the follow-up will end December 2021. Allocation was one by one to EBT and no EBT group. Each group should have 100 patients. Key in inclusion criteria was like this. Pre-MRS should be there to one. Aspects of there to three on CT or MRI. Primary outcome was set MRS of there to three according to the analysis of the registry data. Anyway, we started the RCT and the registration was gradually increased like this, but this time uh, COVID-19 infection was reported in our country and uh, it was spread to the whole country immediately. Some members requested to stop registration and this study due to COVID-19 pandemic. So we were wondering the study should be stopped or not. But when we look at the number of patients and calculate the per population, Japan was in a better situation in terms of the number of the COVID-19. So I thought that this is rather a chance for us. But how to increase registration in COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, we decided to try best to register in our hospital first and ask friends to register the patient as possible and Zoom meeting were held every month to remind the registration to our RCT. Fortunately, with the kind effort of our friends, our registration increased gradually like this. So we saw that uh, the study will be successful in terms of the registration number. If so, I was I got anxious about the results because they reported of their failure experience, failed experience. So, but the office blocked the data very strictly. So one day at December 2022, Dr. Uchide um, came to my office and reported. Report is a usually not good thing. <laughs> so he said, I have a report. I was afraid of any trouble. Limit data was finally opened. Oh, oh, oh. how was that? OR was 2.5, he said. What do you mean? EBT was better significantly. Wow, great. Then we discussed how to report the result. This would be the world's first report to show the efficacy of MT. 
The best scenario is to report it at the late breaking session of ISC and New England Journal simultaneously. We decided to try them. Time was very limited for simultaneous publication. ISC will be held in February 10th. Follow up will finish at the end of December. <laughs> Submission should be done immediately, they said. So we prepared everything before follow up of all cases and submitted the paper just after follow up data registration of the last patient. We got the response at the January 1st morning. I was surprised and relieved to know that that they requested a revision. But there were so many questions, so response letter reached over 50 pages, like magazine. And editor extensively revised our manuscript, and blue lines were their comment, right? Their sentence. We are, our black sentence were almost uh, gone. And uh, they strongly requested us to revise uh, we, uh, according to reviewer's comment, but the reviewer requests us in Japan should be emphasized. Predominant use of MRI and low RT bedos should be written. We wanted to say something, but followed reviewers without resistance for immediate republication. So this is one of the result study flowchart among the eligible patient. Uh, randomized patient number was 203 and allocated to EBT group and no EBT group like this. And the full analysis set was 100 in EBT and 102 in no EBT groups. Patient characteristics, fortunately, there were almost no difference between the groups, excepting aspects was lower in EBT group three compared to four in no EBT group, it means that infarction was a little bit larger in EBT group. In the other factors, there were no difference. And primary outcome, MRS delta 2 3 at 90 days were more frequently observed in EBT group, 31%, compared to 20%. 12.8% in no EBT group. Relative risk of the ratio was 2.43 and p-value was 0.002. So this study showed that EBT improved the functional outcome of acute elbow patients with large ischemic regions. I was relieved to see that there was no difference in MRS zero to two like this. And the shift analysis showed that EBT was better or the ratio was 2.4. And safety outcome, any intracranial hemorrhage within 48 hours were more observed in EBT group as high as 58% and then 31% and no EBT group. But Symptomatic ICH didn't differ between the groups. Um, procedural complications were more observed in EBT group 8.9%, including vessel perforation in 5.0%. Subgroup analysis showed regardless of age, Last known where to hospital to randomize NIHS score, use of ITPA or not, EBT was all, always better. There are some limitations in this study. MRI was dominantly used in our country, especially more used in the present study for judgment of the stroke uh, degree. 
and it was reported that aspects of DWI might be one scale lower than that of CD. So differences in assessment of aspects between CT and MRI diffusion should be considered when you try to ap apply this result to your practice. Generalizability might be limited beyond the Japanese population due to low dose of IVTP and the limited race in this study. As conclusions, EBT increased independent patient MRS of Delta 2 3 by 2.43 times than medical therapy alone in acute elbow patients with large ischemic regions. We have to pay attention to frequent ICH in EBT group, although symptomatic ICH was not significantly different between the groups. This was published in New England Journal of the April. We deeply appreciate the effort by the readers in participating in hospitals uh, in, under a uh, uh, tough period due to COVID-19. Dr. Sakamoto's face is here. And uh, this slide shows a study steering committee members, including co-PI Dr. Sakai and Yamagami and the leaders of the statistics, uh, Professor Norimoto, and the other very important person like this. And we hope more patients with large infarctions will be saved by receiving EBT based on this trial. Very recently, Dr. Uchida reported that the differences between aspect three or lower and aspect four to five in patients with aspects be, three or below, there was no difference in EBT group or no EBT group in terms of the favorable outcome. But the more patient was uh, observed in EBT when the patient aspect was four to five. So if you try to judge the aspects by CT, you have to pay attention to treat the patient with aspect three. We know that many RCTs regarding MT for large ischemic regions are ongoing in the world. Very recently, angel aspect from China was stopped. We don't know whether it was good or bad result, but um, we are looking forward to seeing their results. Message, I encountered EBT for AIS as one of my life works through my mother's treatment. However, I was almost knocked down by big criticisms. And I found that scientific proof was the only way to continue the procedure. With the great advices and the chances given my senior doctors, I could produce good results in an RCT in one of the targets. Already, 17 years have passed from the first try to elbow after TPA with balloons. I deeply appreciate all the members involved in this trial and thank Raja to give me a chance to talk this topic in this webinar suddenly. Thank you for your attention. Excellent presentation, Dr. Yoshimura. It was quite impressive. And especially the way you started doing acute ischemic uh, stroke treatment with a life experience, it is extremely impressive. And it is more impressive that you wanted to do it more scientifically and you've designed a trial and you've designed a trial not once, but more than once to prove that we are updated with the latest advancements that's happening in acute ischemic stroke treatment. Especially the one today, we are looking at treating more and more patients with acute ischemic stroke and we need a large evidence, especially for treating patients with an acute ischemic stroke with a low aspect score. A trial has been organized and uh, it's almost completing in Canada and in the US that trial is ongoing. And even today, we don't have large evidence as far as India is concerned, where I practice in Chennai, uh, I was trained in the US and then I practice in Chennai now. 
we do not have evidence for low aspect score. To my neurologists, I go talk to them. They ask me, where is the evidence? How will you prove that it's going to help? You know, so your, your trial is one of the proof, uh, uh, proof of the pudding that you, you have brought out. And I truly agree with you that uh, treating these patients with properly selected patients the results, I, you have shown the results of pre-canalization MRS of 0 to 3 is three times higher, 31% compared to 12.4% in non-ETV group. That's very impressive. That's very impressive. And going forward, uh, what are your exclusions? What are the cases you will not do? Mm. Thank you for your question. Uh, very recently, we are uh, performing a rapid uh, perfusion imaging for all the patient and some of the patient with low aspect uh, rapid shows no salvageable area okay no penumbra in that case we are wondering if we have to treat the patient or not if we are loyal to the result of our RCT uh, we have to treat, but uh, new re new findings from the recent uh, imaging with rapid might be better to judge. So we are wondering. Okay. Thank you for asking. Absolutely, pleasure. And do you have an experience of selecting patients based on MRI? The mm -hmm. uh, uh, T two uh, or the flare images versus DWI. Uh, mismatch, do you use yes, that as a criteria? Yes, yes. Uh, we uh, actually we changed the inclusion criteria uh, during the uh, registration uh, one and a half years ago. We, we updated our inclusion criteria. That uh, criteria included uh, diffusion and flare mismatch, uh, can be one of the uh, indication for this trial. So we you, you can incre, incre, uh, include the patient with uh, diffusion flare mismatch patient. Perfect, very good. Is there any other question? Let me see the chat box. What was the time gap in the onset of symptoms and treatment in case one? Mm, it was very short. Case one, case mm -hmm. one. It was uh, I. I remember that it was uh, the patient was reopened within an hour, but the same in case two. So just after MT, we thought that the case two will be also dramatically improved, but unfortunately, hemorrhagic transmission uh, occurred. So we still don't know the reason, the difference between these two cases. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I mean, obviously, when we do lower aspects more and more, we encounter our symptomatic ICH rate is going to be relatively higher. Right. So today, when you, after your trial, when you counsel a patient, when you talk to them, mm. what is the percentage of reperfusion related hemorrhage you would tell the patient? And what are the chances the patient may need a decompression after successful mechanical thrombectomy? Mm, based on our uh, uh, data, uh, re, uh, any ICS was uh, observed in half of the patient, okay? Okay. and uh, but the symptomatic ICH was only around ten percent, actually nine percent in our study. But the Dr. Uchida's sub analysis showed that uh, in aspect three, uh, hemorrhagic rate was higher, so larger. The larger infarction uh, led to uh, a higher percentage of post-operative hemorrhage. We explained like this. Okay, thank you, thank you. That's impressive. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Paramashivam, for that comments. And uh, I'm extremely grateful to Professor Yoshimura for accepting our invitation for such a short notice. <laughs> And uh, first of all, let me congratulate you for this outstanding work you have done. I really never knew that there was a touching personal story behind this motivation that uh, has led to practice of inculcating 
uh, and vascular thrombectomy and popularizing it in your country and as i'm uh, reminded by one of the quotes of the giants that first they ignore you and then they laugh at you then they fight with you and finally you win you have showed us uh, exactly how you, the success of uh, your procedures have been all through the scientific uh, analysis of your uh, cases that you have shown us thank you very much i would like to ask two questions uh, what were the incidents of futile reperfusions in your mm. case series? And mm. the second question, as you show in case two, how many cases or were there any cases that underwent uh, decompressive hem hemicraniectomy as a large life saving procedures? And what was the outcome in them? Yes, thank you for your important questions. Um, actually, uh, we don't have an exact percentage of the futile. Uh, Reperfusion, but uh, our impression is that uh, mm, around the uh, mm, in our data shows uh, only thirty one patient uh, what had a good fa uh, favorable outcome M MRS zero to three. So it means that among one hundred patients received EBT, a one third should a significant improvement. It means that two thirds didn't change or minimum change, right? So this should be taken in your consideration to decide your uh, treatment. Okay, that this is the first uh, question that's for. The second one was some um, uh, ah, decompression, mm, decompressive craniectomy. Yes, uh, symptomatic ICH was only observed in 9% of the series. So I guess that um, only uh, half of that received a uh, uh, craniectomy. Okay, thank you very much. Well, our friend Ben has joined us from Hong Kong. Ben, any questions from you? Yes, and uh, very encouraging um, and excellent uh, results for, uh, on your side. And I would like to congratulate uh, on your success. And uh, thank you so much for uh, uh, keep the spirit. And uh, I really, I really, really appreciate and impressed by uh, your your case of sharing. And uh, and my question is about uh, in your practice. Um, how would you consider um, uh, 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 a fail, a failed mechanical thrombectomy. How long would you try if you fail to um, uh, pers uh, to reperfuse the vessel? And uh, uh, if there is, uh, if you encounter this situation that you um, attempt so many times and you still fail to um, open up the vessel, uh, what would you? Uh, is is there any subsequent uh, strategy? For example, you would. In some sense, you may consider a, a surgical uh, open from me in Japan. So, so uh, what's your uh, opinion on that? Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your comment and uh, questions. Um, yes, uh, um, duration from the onset to reperfusion. Uh, we limited um, six hours uh, after onset and uh, if the patient uh, transferred to our hospital without any a definite uh, onset time we we use the uh, mri to see a uh, mismatch between a uh, diffusion and flare if patient had a flare and the diffusion mismatch it will be regarded as uh, four hours from the onset so we, we target that we treated the patient we uh, allocate the patient to this trial and uh, but uh, if in your in your in our practice it, it is not a limited uh, time from the puncture to reperfusion so we still don't know the maximum uh, uh, period from the puncture to reperfusion so Oh, we, 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 it's an interesting idea, so we'd like to um, um, analyze uh, next chance. Thank you. And Thank also, you uh, bypass, bypass. I was working actually uh, emergent bypass previously, extensively, before <laughs> uh, stent retrieval introduction, because uh, 
only baroangioplasty is the best cell was not reopened well. So um, emergent bypass was uh, sometimes very effective to rescue the uh, hemisphere, uh, not in the deep part of hemisphere. But recently, the chances is very limited because recently the reperfusion rate is reaching around 90% of the patient. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, my co-host, Dr. Liu Bun Seng. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Raja. Thanks, Professor, for a very fascinating uh, lecture. Uh, two questions, Professor. Uh, you have shown that uh, the, the uh, Trombectomy group C have a, a slightly uh, higher chance of uh, intracerebral hemorrhage after procedure. Uh, do you think that what factor that uh, causing uh, the higher risk of intracranial uh, hemorrhage is it due uh, or what can be done to reduce that? Mm. Uh, wh whether uh, in those groups the BP control are worse than the medical group, uh, whether that is the reason or what can be done to reduce that? My second question, Professor, uh, you did show that the one of the limiting factors in your study is low dose of uh, IVRTPA. Mm. So may I know, uh, is, is, is it in the medical uh, group, medical therapy group, or, or overall is lower than the recommended dose? Uh, mm. that Thank you. Are we going to first question? The, yes, uh, among the Intracranial hemorrhage after the procedure involves um, includes uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage and also intraparenchymal hemorrhage, as you know. Um, and subarachnoid hemorrhage main cause was um, uh, stretching the vessels by uh, scent retriever or aspiration catheter. So, or our careful manipulation may reduce the hemorrhage rate in case of subarachnoid hemorrhage. But in parenchymal hemorrhage, uh, my impression is the um, main part was uh, hemorrhagic transformation in uh, infarction. It is, not, um, uh, it is not possible to reduce the uh, uh, percentage by our uh, technique. So uh, according to Dr. Uchida's uh, report to German Neurology recently, the aspect three or lower uh, led to a higher percentage of uh, parenchymal hemorrhage. So that was um, associated with the indication and so we may be able to risk the hemorrhage by uh, reducing the blood pressure after the procedure, but um, that is limited. This is my impression. So SH can be reduced by our technique, but intraparenchymal hemorrhage, no. And the second question was um, the, uh, the uh, lower dose of our RTPA in the ah, study yes. limitation. Yes, um, actually, uh, in Western uh, people, um, um, there is a low risk of uh, intracranial hemorrhage due to IBTPA, but in, in us, Asian, a uh, higher percentage of hemorrhage was already reported. So in Japanese stroke society, he tried a lower dose, two third of so 0.6 milligram per kilogram uh, TPA was safe and uh, almost had almost a similar effect in getting the favorable outcome compared to 0.9 percent, uh, 0.9 milligram per kilogram Western dose. So result was similar. So that's why our society's uh, guideline. Uh, employed 0.6 milligram per kilogram. So this is a standard and recommended by our society's guidelines. So we have to follow that. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. Now we can go back to our chair who could close this session with his concluding remarks. It was a great evening with uh, <clears throat> two great presentations from uh, Professor Sakamoto and uh, Professor y Yoshimura. And the first, we learned a lot about the aneurysm, its newer techniques in coiling, 
and then about the stroke thrombectomy and the newer frontiers that we achieved in uh, stroke thrombectomy. So it's a lot of insight and the discussion was insightful and uh, we learned a lot and I hope the audience as well, everybody who participated would have learned a lot and it was quite stimulating and people who do uh, thrombectomies, uh, yeah, the story that uh, Dr. Ashimura said and uh, the, the way uh, he has been pursuing his career is, is a footpath other people can follow in terms of devising new trends and uh, modernized trials are needed to, to achieve new frontiers. I thank both the uh, speakers for the wonderful presentation. Uh, I thank uh, the organizers and all the participants. And with this, uh, we close the session. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it was indeed a very lively session and we learned a lot. I'll close this officially now on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kaito. I would like to thank both speakers of today, Professor Sakamoto and Professor Shinichi Yoshimura, as well as Jair Professor Parmasivam for their time and support for the ACNS webinars. I am extremely grateful to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this on the WeChat channel and our numbers just soared up to more than 350 during the talk of Professor Yoshimura. Thank you very much, Professor Shubin, for that. And also thank Dr. Libun Singh, my co-host for today, for joining me today. So until we all meet on the 24th of December, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you very much for joining.